Welcome to the Federal Highway Administration's informational DVD on median crossover crashes. The purpose of this video is to introduce you to the various options that are available to help mitigate these dangerous and often deadly crashes. Within the United States in 2003, an average of one roadway departure injury crash occurred every 43 seconds. And on average, one roadway departure fatality crash occurred every 23 minutes. In 2006, on the national highway system alone, there were 821 median crossover crashes resulting in fatalities. More road construction in East Texas, but TxDOT believes this project is sure to save lives. New barriers are being put in, and the medians along I-20 and down a good chunk of I-30. The project comes at a cost of upwards of $25 million, but TxDOT feels it is worth the cost to save lives. In Harrison County today, workers were busy fixing the post for cables that will run the length of I-20 in that county. Cables are also planned along parts of Highway 59 in Harrison County. Also from Mount Pleasant to Texarkana along I-30, cables are going in. Now in Van Zant, Smith and Gregg Counties, concrete barriers will soon be added. TxDOT officials hope these medians make head-on collisions a thing of the past. Especially on the interstate, a number of, uh, a number of accidents that have been caused by traffic that, that crosses the median and, and, and it's generally always a fatality when that happens. According to the North Carolina Department of Transportation, median crossover crashes are three times more severe than other highway crashes, and they're happening more frequently. In the time it takes to yawn, change a radio station, or answer a cell phone call, a vehicle traveling at freeway speeds can cross highway median and strike opposing traffic head-on. With traffic moving at high speeds on freeways with narrow medians and no median barriers, median crossover head-on crashes can have deadly results. One major contributing factor to the problem is the volume of traffic on our freeways today. A cross-median head-on crash is really one of a number of associated events. The initial event occurs when the driver loses control of the vehicle and enters the median. A flat median will allow some drivers to regain control and come to a safe stop or to safely re-enter the roadway. All too often, however, the vehicle crosses the median and enters the opposing roadway causing a secondary event, a head-on crash with another vehicle. Fortunately, measures designed to help prevent these head-on crashes from taking place are available. When a vehicle leaves the road on a trajectory across the median, the probability of hitting one or more oncoming vehicles in the opposing lanes increases significantly if no barrier exists, particularly if the median is narrow. Once this subsequent collision across the median occurs, an innocent driver headed in the opposing direction is now included in the equation. Traditional mitigation tools, such as enforcement and warning signs, may not solve the problem and roadway design changes may be impractical. However, an effective solution does exist. Median barriers are longitudinal barriers most commonly used to separate opposing directions of traffic on a divided roadway. These barriers also may be used along heavily traveled roadways to separate through traffic from local traffic or to separate high occupancy vehicle lanes from general purpose lanes. One main difference between roadside and median barriers is that median barriers are typically designed to redirect vehicles striking either side of the barrier. While these systems may not reduce the frequency of crashes due to lane departure, they can definitely help prevent a median crash from becoming a median crossover head-on collision. Let's take a brief look at some popular systems and highlight some benefits and drawbacks to consider when selecting an appropriate median barrier system. There are three basic categories of median barriers. Rigid barrier systems, semi-rigid barrier systems, and flexible barrier systems.
Some factors involved when considering a barrier system include the types of vehicles using the roadway, the roadway geometry, and the potential severity of a median crossover crash if one were to occur. In most cases, a standard barrier capable of redirecting passenger cars, light vans, and trucks would be adequate to do the job. However, at some locations which may have adverse geometrics, high traffic volumes and speeds, significant amounts of heavy truck traffic, or perhaps for environmental reasons, a higher performance median barrier may be more appropriate. Wider medians can provide additional room for vehicles to stop before entering the opposing lanes, but even medians 75 to 100 feet wide or more have allowed errant vehicles to cross. The American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO, Roadside Design Guide, was revised in 2006 to recommend that high volume highway medians of 50 feet or less be considered for a barrier and that barriers were an option in medians between 50 and 70 feet wide. Concrete barriers are the most common type of rigid median barrier in use today. There have been recent variations to this system. In addition to the New Jersey shape, the F-shape and the single slope, or vertical wall, are being used. Each of these barriers has slight design variations in shape, construction type, and reinforcement that offer advantages. With the F-shape, there is consistently less ride-up of the crash test vehicle, and therefore, improved vehicle stability as compared to the New Jersey shape. While the initial cost of installation can be relatively high, Concrete barriers are known for their relatively low life cycle cost, effective safety performance, and their maintenance-free characteristics. Concrete barrier systems have proven to be highly effective in locations with high traffic volumes and high speeds. These barrier systems are also very effective at places with heavy truck traffic and in areas where sufficient median widths to accommodate other barrier systems are not available. One problem is that crashes associated with rigid barriers may result in more severe injuries. Relative to other barrier systems, a rigid system absorbs the least energy in a crash. However, these systems have been proven to be very effective at mitigating median crossover collisions. Although the concrete barrier has been used on many highways nationwide, other systems may be even more appropriate in some locations. Another type of median barrier system is the semi-rigid system, commonly referred to as guardrail or guide rail. Guardrails have been in use for many years, and there have been quite a few modifications to the design of these systems over the years. Typically, Semi-rigid systems consist of some assembly of connected segments of metal railing supported by posts and blocks. Three of the most common types of metal rails are the W-beam, thri-beam, and the box beam. The semi-rigid barrier system is most suitable for use in traversable medians having no significant terrain irregularities. While semi-rigid barriers can be less costly, they can also be more difficult to install in some locations. One drawback is that they can become expensive over their life cycle if they require repair following an impact. Guardrail systems can absorb energy in a crash. The entire assembly is designed to move or rotate through the soil during an impact. Design adjustments can vary post stiffness and alter the resulting dynamic deflection and deceleration rate that occurs in a crash. Spacer blocks are used to offset the rail element from the posts to minimize vehicle snagging on the posts. Another type of median barrier system is the cable barrier. The typical cable barrier consists of multiple steel cables that are connected to a series of posts 
These systems can be the most versatile and forgiving barrier systems available for reducing the severity of median crossover crashes. Although modern cable barriers have been in use since the 1960s, it was not until the 1980s that some state departments of transportation began using a modified cable rail as a median barrier. Today, many states are taking advantage of advances in design that allow them to install cable barriers in mediums originally built without barriers. Those new cable barriers on I-270 credited with saving a father's life. 10 to be night beat reporter Patrick Bell has the story. He just dropped the kids off and was on his way to work and passed out in his car in 270. And a car just ripped across two lanes of traffic, almost like a blowout. He would have gone into the, on the other side of the road and um, I would have gotten a different phone call. She calls it a miracle. A miracle her husband is still alive. And a miracle young Emma still has her father. If those barriers weren't up, um, I guess I'd be a single mom right now. Here's the reason a family is so very grateful. A nondescript spider web of steel and cable, a picket fence of sorts that saves lives. We're really lucky. Friday, Margaret Schuler's husband, Scott, lost control of his SUV, according to witnesses. He'd come across and hit it on an angle like this, caught the barrier, and it just kind of sucked him in and just stopped him. Instead of Scott plowing through the median into oncoming traffic, as so many other drivers have done throughout the years. The kids can still say they have a dad, and I can still say I have a husband because of those barriers. So we're very fortunate. The cable median barrier works by gradually redirecting an impacting vehicle. The cable barrier has an elastic effect, which minimizes forces on the vehicle and its occupants and absorbs most of the energy of a crash. In comparison to rigid and semi-rigid barrier systems, cable barrier systems generally have a lower installation cost. Like guardrails, however, they typically require maintenance after a crash and therefore can have a higher life cycle cost. Research shows that cable median barriers are more forgiving than traditional concrete or metal beam barriers as they deflect the crash force laterally and reduce the forces transmitted to vehicle occupants. Some states are turning to cable median barriers in areas where there is a high potential for crashes and sufficient median width so that vehicles can land safely outside the travel lanes. One problem associated with low tension cable systems is when several posts are hit during a single crash. The barrier system may then be vulnerable to subsequent crossovers until the damaged section is repaired. Rapid maintenance and barrier repair is very important. Various manufacturing companies have developed new high tension cable barrier systems that significantly reduce deflection which means cables don't flex laterally as far as their lower tension predecessors, so they can be used in narrower spaces. There are several high tension cable barrier systems that have been developed and are increasing in use. These systems are installed with a significantly greater tension in the cables than the low tension cable system. Cables are tensioned five times greater than in lower tension cable systems. Because the cables are tensioned, the deflection of the system is significantly reduced. These cable systems result in less damage to the barrier, and in many cases, the cables remain at the proper height after an impact that may have damaged several posts. In most cases, Posts can be quickly reinstalled in sleeves. Several high-tension cable designs are now available that can withstand multiple hits. In February of 2007, we had two severe winter storms within a, a week. This three-mile section of high-tension cable was hit seven times and remained functional. High-tension cable barrier systems are currently being used in many jurisdictions across the United States.
You may now be wondering what type of treatment is most appropriate for the median location under review. The American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials Organization has developed guidelines on the placement of median barriers. The relevant guidelines are contained in Chapter 6 of the Roadside Design Guide. The ashto.org website also has a link to its technology implementation group, which includes reports on cable median barrier performance. The National Cooperative Highway Research Program began a study in 2007 to develop guidelines for the use of cable median barriers. These include the location, terrain, alignment, and expected deflection from the barrier system. The available guidance can help you on how to design the system in a way that can respond appropriately to your particular issues and aid you in selecting the best system for your application. Some concerns have been raised with respect to certain types of vehicles and their potential interaction with some systems. With some of the information presented here, you may also want to review and possibly update your agency's policies on highway median barrier systems to incorporate the use of the full range of systems described. We hope that we have shown you how median barrier systems are changing and how they can be cost-effective tools to improve safety and save lives. They should be considered by all transportation and road authorities in the United States. If you would like to explore median barrier systems in greater detail, please visit the Federal Highway Administration's website listed on the screen or type FHWA Median Barrier into an internet search engine. Thank you for taking the time to view this presentation.